What's up, Denver? Chris Lopez here. And today's podcast is going to be a deal analysis for a value-add industrial building. So what makes this interesting is a group based in Denver buying this in Indianapolis. And there is about a fourth of the building that was office space. And there was potential to convert back to industrial. So a couple new things we need to learn here and a couple very interesting aspects to this. And to walk us through the deal, I have William Foy and Marcus Davis from Spearhead Commercial Capital, and they did the debt financing on here. Good morning, guys. Good morning. Good morning. I did a bad job of introducing you guys at the exact same time. <laughs> William, good morning. I don't even know your voice. I just realized. We got to get better at this. I got to yeah. get better at this. Thanks, Chris. All My right. name's William. There you go. <laughs> Marcus, how are you? I'm awesome, man. There Thanks go. for having me. <laughs> Um, okay, so I, I found this deal very fascinating just because you know this is this is new stuff for me. So William, tee this up for us. Uh first with just kind of like the profile of the investor group on here, if you could. Yeah, so we have a pretty experienced investor group that has uh twenty something million on in their total portfolio. They've traditionally been value add guys, mainly in multifamily, but they're building out um the industrial side of their portfolio. And um I think, you know, this is this is, um, you know, my guess, but it's been a little bit harder to chase yield on multifamily stuff around Denver. So they've kind of transitioned to this triple net, um, industrial type of asset class where, um, you know, there's a little bit more meat on the bone in terms of return and they know that market well. And, um, now they're kind of chasing some of those assets out of state. So, um, I want to, I normally don't put triple net and value add in the same sentence. I, I, I traditionally think of like triple net as just, hey, it's a place people go park the cash, the Little Caesars or the Walgreens or whoever is running out the property. Mm-hmm. Is that how normal is it to have like a value add and a triple net together? Because I want you to, I, I want to learn about this. Yeah, I'd say pretty normal, actually. I mean, if you pick up, you think of like retail where there's a lot of triple net is what you kind of mentioned, right? Um, industrial is very similar. So if you have a multi-tenant industrial building where... Uh, maybe it's in a very strong industrial market where there's not very much vacancy, um, but the tenants in you know the identified property are below market. There's pretty much immediate opportunity to go in there and um, you know and, and raise those rents much like you would in a multifamily type of scenario. In this particular building, there um, happened to be you know eighty thousand of three hundred twenty thousand square feet that was um, kind of geared toward office for a tenant that vacated. So there was immediate opportunity for them to convert that, get a new tenant in there at market rents that would then drive, you know, upward momentum in the existing tenants when their, when their leases came for renewal. Okay. And so I guess it's pretty similar for like industrial buildings that the tenant is paying for taxes, insurance, and maintenance. They're kind of paying for everything just like you would with a triple net? Yes, exactly. Okay. So thank you very much for that. I appreciate that. Sure. So getting back to this deal, um, walk us through kind of like their business plan to take down this because I, I found some of the the creative stuff just very intriguing. Yeah. So they, uh, much like multifamily or value add, um, they are looking for value add. So, um, you know, it was... <laughs> not a big industrial market in Colorado necessarily because of, you know, uh, cannabis and, um, lease terms. there just kind of astronomical compared to some of the other markets. So I think they kind of, you know, looked at, you think about the bread basket of America and where a lot of things are being manufactured. It kind of ends up being in, um, you know, the Midwest. And so Mm -hmm. they kind of honed in on this, um, Indianapolis MSA. They had some familiarity with uh, prior investments there. So I think that helped them along and, came across this property, which there were kind of three facets of it. One of which I already talked, talked about, which was, you know, existing vacancy, which created opportunity for them, um, below market rents kind of number two. And then this site actually has, um, a separate parcel pad site where, um, there was opportunity for potential, you know, future development or just entitling that pad site and selling that off to put money back in their pocket as well. Okay, so they may have quite a few options on here we could yeah. do with the property then. Yep. So they get the property. Can you kind of just give us the high level like numbers on the purchase price, debt? Because I think you said this is the one where there is 
when they bought it, uh, NOI and debt service coverage ratio were basically like one to one. Yeah. So, which is uh, really low. Yeah. So, purchase price on, um, you know, kind of the, the existing improved land parcel, because there's two parcels, uh, was going to be something list price was like 6.25 million. Um, I think the separate parcel penciled out somewhere around a million bucks. Um, and that transaction was was part of this, but we'll just kind of leave that as it is because it was just sort of a, a cash grab in their sense where they could pick up a parcel, probably get the permit for it, and then sell that to somebody else, and that would help them kind of pay down their loan and um, you know give the, or or give them more returns as part of the project. So I'll kind of leave that one be out of the the underwriting numbers here. But where they ended up on purchase price was six point one five. Um, and they figured they needed about 600 to 650 in tenant improvement dollars to convert that 80,000 of, uh, square foot office space to true industrial space that could be used by, you know, or widen the, the pool of, of tenants who could come in and, and lease that space. I mean, not every manufacturer needs, you know, a hundred thousand square feet and, uh, yeah. a manufacturing floor plus $80,000 of, uh, or 80,000 square feet of office. So they felt it was going to be better for them to just come you know, convert that office to true industrial space. All right. So the majority of that money, or I guess all the money was just going towards that office back to industrial conversion. Yep, exactly. What was the other, what was that? I guess three quarters of the building like was already existing tenants in there, fully occupied. Yeah. Any upside there? Yep. The rest of the building was um, fully occupied, multiple tenants um, below market rents though. So that was kind of the upside for them. Um, I think the seller kind of just, you know, it was part of a, a bigger portfolio where this smaller asset compared to what they were already holding didn't get a lot of attention. So um, it was one of those where they had an opportunity to come in and um, really put some TLC into into the property and uh, get the tenants up to rents where, you know, it begs the question, well, you know, why wouldn't, would the tenants really swallow uh, an increase like that? Um, to get them to market rents, the answer is yes, because the the vacancy in this particular market was two percent. So not a lot of places for these tenants to go, wow. especially in a space where they've been for a handful of years. Um, and so, you know, as a tenant, you look at what's my cost to move somewhere else um, when I have everything right here. Should I just you know eat a, a 50, 50 cent per you know square foot? Yeah. How how much under rent was this building or the existing leases? To market five percent, ten percent. The buyers felt like they were about fifteen percent below market. Rents. Okay, so fairly substantial. Mm-hmm. When did the leases mature, and who were the tenants? Yeah, so we had some tenants in there that um, were nationally known. Um, wouldn't go as far as saying credit publicly traded credit tenants, but very well known tenants, um, and that helps certainly helps the lender along with, you know, getting comfortable with who's in there, what their options are for, you know, being able to you know, um, to incur a a significant increase in, in their lease rate. Um, but also, you know, you know, where, where else are they going to go find space in 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 an area, you know, where, where they need to, where they have roots, you know? Um, so that was part of the, the discussion with the lender too. And to touch on your point, Chris, is the challenge on this from a financing perspective was with that vacancy, um, you know, we had a coming in debt service coverage ratio of basically one to one, meaning the annual debt service um, per the loan request is pretty much the same as the NOI we had um, trickling in on the property. And okay, so how was it structured? Because I imagine they wanted to put as little cash down, do the work, season the property, put whatever cash you could come back out, just the classic value add, you know, business model. But how'd that come out when a core of the building is in? you know, not being used right now, below market rent, like, and how did it come out from like a financing perspective? Sure. So the lender, um, knowing that there was going to be some tenant improvement, they didn't have to move out any tenant, which meant that they could start on the tenant improvements right away. Um, so the lender was able to structure, um, basically a 70% loan to cost. Um, so that would be cost of building cost of total rehab. So 6.15 purchase price, you know, 650 or 600 to 650 in, in total rehab dollars, um, gives you kind of total costs around 6.8 million. 
that's how we landed a 4.665 loan amount, which is basically 70% of the, the borrower's total cost on the project. When the approximate was still being done? This was uh, first part of 2022, beginning of 2022. Okay, so I mean, it was during some of this raising interest rate environment yep, too, which I'm absolutely. sure <laughs> changed a few things on here and probably uh, yeah. had you guys do extra work. Yeah, it was definitely a little bit of a, a sphincter tighten because we... <laughs> we We'd kind of solidified the rate at the end of 2021 before rates really had a lot of upward okay. momentum. And it was just about trying to protect, uh, you know, the, the, the lender's rate through like a, what ended up being kind of a 70 day close. Okay. Yeah. What were you estimating the rate at the end and where to kind of finish out at? Um, they were actually to, able to hold the rate that they put out on the initial term sheet at oh, three and a half percent. And we were we we're kind of tracking that along. Now that didn't come, you know, cheap. They the the borrower had to pony up, you know, a little bit of a deposit to make sure that you know the deal wasn't going to get retraded by another lender at the eleventh hour. Okay. So we were able to kind of shore up, um, you know, a quasi rate lock by way of that. Well, I'm sure the buyer was probably thrilled about that. I would imagine. So yeah. Seeing where so rates are so. Yeah, it was fine. How long will it take him to do the TI, the tenant improvements? Yeah, so we um, arranged 24 months of interest only on the front end of a five-year note. Um, so that was going to allow them plenty of time to build out and lease that space. So they were paying interest only on the full loan amount um, for two years. That allows them to kind of get done in there what they need to get done. They felt like full stabilization was going to come in year three um, in terms of rehabbing the vacant space, getting that leased at market rates, and then, you know, trying to gradually negotiate in um, closer to market rents on the existing tenants as well. Okay. And so they're estimating, you said around year three, anything around year three, then they might kind of start the refi process. So this lender kind of built in, you know, kind of a, an earn out, if you will. So an um, earn out. Yeah. So these guys could, upon stabilization, draw more cash out without like a true refi because the lender got a as is and as completed stabilized appraisal value. So after, you know, 650 of tenant improvements based on what the rents would look like with that rented and getting some of the other tenants up to more market rents, um, we had an as stabilized value of 7.5 million, whereas your total cost in was 6.8. So they could actually go back to the lender grab that earn out, recoup their tenant improvement dollars, um, and, you know, have the same, same kind of terms at 3.5% fixed rate. Is that structure, uh, common? It's pretty uncommon, I would say, okay. unless there's true meat on the bone, um, you know, for value add where there is like a totally vacant space. Um, and the lender can see, Hey, we've got good tenants in here who really don't have any other choice, but to stay plus getting, you know, true industrial space in there with another tenant at market rents. Um, that was kind of the upside and it was a priority. These guys are value add guys. So they wanted to, you know, they felt like their whole, whole period was going to be five to seven years anyway. Mm -hmm. So they'll reevaluate in year five and say, do we sell this thing because we've improved it? Um, depending on market conditions, they might sell it um, or they might just hold it, hold it for cash flow. Okay. That makes sense. Yeah, because I mean, I've never heard the phrase "earn out." I always think of the phrase "earn out" like yeah. someone's being, "Hey, you sell a business, you get your you get your buyout to earn out." Just it's a it's a new term. Is that the term they call it in lending? Or, uh, or is this kind like, of like William says, it's situation? kind of a rare it's kind of a rare product. But the bank is like earmarking these funds that are going to be earned out for you. You're not be you're not paying interest on these funds at the time, and when you perform at the level where you've earned your earn out. You'll do a loan modification at that time, and essentially they're just going to match the terms that they gave you day one, and just bump up your loan amount. So it's a beautiful product for these value add guys, and I think yeah. it shows that the lending world is trying to kind of fit in these value add guys into their their conventional type of underwriting world. Well, it makes sense, especially. I mean, lenders probably want to keep the loan as well. That's I right. Mean, it helps, it helps them retain the loan. So with that, the I guess the benchmark to the earnout was they've invested the money, the six fifty in, in tenant improvements. It's been completed. I'm assuming they'll send an inspector to go walk the property. Sure. And then um, a, a certain amount of that have to be leased up. 
So the appraisal would in that stabilized value, they would say, Hey, it's in the based off a of 90% occupancy and you know, this kind of, um, NOI figure. Okay. Yeah. As long as it, it hits that, it's just pretty much black one. Hey, great. Check, check, check. Great. Draw your funds. Yep, exactly. And go. so I mean, more or less, right. The, the, the lender wants to prove out their pro forma numbers and everything, you know, based on uh, an underwrite, um, but yes, that's that's it. It was a structure on the front end to to shake out with you know the appraisal value um, and occupant physical occupancy plus NOI figures. Okay, and you had mentioned that this was a regional bank, mm-hmm. a regional bank uh, out there, not in Denver, but a regional bank in Indianapolis. Um, how much impact is having like because you, know, you said these were you know big local businesses and tenants like. If it's random tenant one, two, three versus a big regional company, does that impact the bank's underwriting or uh, risk tolerance since you've got a big anchor tenant versus, you know, Chris Lopez's new business or how's that play? Yeah, I, um, I might have flip flopped those in my notes to you, but it's actually a regional bank here. Um, they do not have footprint in India oh, okay. but because the borrowers here in Denver, they'll follow them out of state. Oh, Okay. Um, so they can do deals for these guys kind of across the country, even though their bank doesn't have footprint, um, in that state, they are here in Colorado and the borrowers here in Colorado. So we can kind of utilize them nationwide. Oh, no, that they, was my misunderstanding earlier. Okay. So it was the local, um, it was a regional bank here following them around. Yeah, okay. exactly. Um, and so to, to answer your question, yeah, the, the kind of credit worthiness of the tenants makes a big difference, um, to, to the lender because of the capacity, right. Um, are these guys capable of paying more money or this going to see the lease increase and then bail, you know? Um, so that is important. Um, it's important to kind of know, be able to underwrite them at some level, right. Um, you know, Joe's manufacturing company probably doesn't have as big a presence and, you know, um, on the internet or wherever, um, when you meet them in person, it's like, what, you know, what do you guys do? Who are you versus seeing some of the names on the lease? It's like, Oh, okay. I know that company. I've seen that company around and makes the lender just overall feel, you know, warmer and fuzzier inside in terms of, um, you know, the, the tenant's ability to pay. Okay. Yeah. Like in that scenario, like a credit tenant to his point would be like somewhere you could underwrite via, a Google search, right? You find their investor reports and you can see their last year revenue and, and cash flow. Um, kind of like a mid tier or smaller to large company where they're not public, but you still have good brand recognition and you're aware who they are. That kind of becomes a little bit easier. It's the mom and pops are, are a challenge, but it's extremely common for an investor to request a due diligence package that includes you know, financial reports of the tenant. So even Mm. if the bank doesn't ask for it, which in a lot of situations they won't, especially if they know these guys have really good experience from a borrower standpoint, um, it's still a great practice for an investor to go ahead and request Joe Schmo's uh, last couple of years financials to see if he does have the ability to perform on the lease, you know, so. And I wouldn't say that's necessarily a deal killer too. If you have like a bunch of unknown tenants in there, um, or smaller tenants, that's not necessarily a bad thing, but for a bank kind of, for lack of a better term, sort of rolling the dice on out of footprint, you know, property for them, um, with a lot of value add, um, not, you know, not the appropriate debt service cover on the front end, even though, you know, the, the pro forma looks solid in terms of cash flow, you know, adding in some tenants of, you know, um, lesser known, you know, means, I guess would be pretty challenging. It'd be, you start to chalk up a bunch of strikes instead of, okay, we can maybe figure out, get comfortable with that. And this has a diversified rent roll, numerous tenants. I think when you're, you were talking about some single tenant opportunities, Walgreens or Dairy Queen or whoever else, it seems like those single tenant opportunities are where you really have to hone in on their ability to perform because it's a hundred percent of your rent roll, a hundred percent of your collection. So it is nice when those are credit tenants for say, because you believe that Walgreens is going to, you know, perform on their, their ability there, but it becomes tougher if it's a single tenant and then Joe Schmoes. So I'm curious on like 
just out-of-state deals like this, since this is a local bank with a relationship with the investor group here, when they invest out-of-state out or loan out-of-state that's kind of outside their wheelhouse or footprint, like how how important, this is probably very hard to quantify, but how important is that relationship for the bank? Like, great, there's the property, and they know some of it, but there's also like, hey, I know you as the investor, William, or I know you as the investor, Marcus, like, how much the bank is saying, hey, we know you, we like you, we trust you. Yeah, we're gonna go, we'll, we'll go some extra mile. Like, how much does that relationship bank come to play in situations like this? It helps a lot. They look very much at liquidity and say, all right, well, hey, if they have some, they have some vacancy issues because some of these tenants don't bite off on what they're, you know, trying to, where they're trying to increase the leases. Does the borrower team or sponsorship team have, you know, um, some liquidity to keep this thing going in, in the event of greater than 70% vacancy or yeah. something like that, you know, can they make the mortgage payments until they figure it out? Um, so, um, I think it, it plays in a lot proximity, maybe not so much. It's just one of those things where it's still kind of a face to face business. You know, they want to be able to see the whites of someone's eyes and show up on their doorstep if they had to from a lending <laughs> perspective. But I mean, um, you know, these guys have a track record of performing, yeah. at, um, you know, solid, you know, liquidity overall that, um, but it wasn't tied up in this deal at all. Um, so just, you know, overall pretty, pretty strong performance, um, of, of pro forma property and, and sponsorship. And the lender didn't have a relationship with the borrower before, you know, William put together his package and presented it to him. So I think a little bit of the credit goes to, to William's presentation and our so our oh. relationship with our so maybe more our relationship was it with more the your guys' relationship I think with so. the borrower okay or our relationship with the lender as well right because yeah. they're getting to know the borrower through us we've done numerous deals with this lender that have been similar profiles so I think at some level that's where the relationship really is is more or less between us and our lender and not necessarily the borrower although. The borrower and the lender now have a path to have a great relationship. So. Yeah. And it's a repeat client for us. We sort of already knew them. We've worked on some multifamily assets for them, for them in the past. This is kind of our first go around on the industrial side. Um, but, um, you know, we were able to kind of show where they've been and where they where they are with some of their existing assets. Um, but, yeah, um, we cannot discount our relationship with the lender, too, because, you know, when it comes from us um, – I think they have a greater, we pre underwrite everything. So I think they kind of had a greater um, confidence in the deal at first look, you know, it's not like, Oh, oh this yeah. is one-to-one -one cash flow, but hang with me because <laughs> yeah, there's yeah. more. <laughs> and then, yeah, but no, I mean that, that makes complete sense, especially in just, you know, in, in that type of lending environment, just relationships matter so much. And I didn't think about the connection, especially you guys are kind of sitting between the middle there of a relation with the bank, you know, one hand, relation with the borrower on the other hand, and you guys just played matchmaker, but able to leverage that relationship for a good just win-win, Yeah, which is, that's well, always the goal. And we knew the ultimate goal because we always sit down with our clients and figure out what their priorities are, figure out how we can make that debt meet their priorities as best we can, knowing that this was like a heavy value add lift for these guys um, and where they, where they knew they could get this thing. Um, within a couple of years, that helps a ton when we're presenting that to, yeah. to lenders. It's like, hey, here's where we're going. And you are going to be in a more favorable loan to value position at the end of this and a much better DSCR position. After like our clients time. are both our borrowers and our lenders. So we're kind of in that weird. Um, we want to be fully transparent, of course. But yeah, like we have longstanding relationships with both sides. So we need the deals to work as well. You know? Oh, yeah, Absolutely. <laughs> Um, and so with that, like, I mean, end of the day, we're at the finish line here. Did it, the, did the loan product meet the terms and requirements for what the borrowers wanted? Yeah, I think they would ideally that the borrowers would have liked to see more of a seven year term, but it just wasn't there. I mean, we had almost a hundred percent roll off of, of leases. So, um, knowing that their hold was going to be around five years anyway, and they're going to re, you're going to reevaluate this thing based on you know, year three, really between years three and five, do we sell it? Are we, you know, good? Are we going to extend? Are we going to cash out refi some more? Because in the last, you know, between year three and year five, you still have increase in, mm -hmm. in standard lease verbiage in terms of NOI. So, um, 
they probably could tap this thing for even more cash in year five. Um, so, you know, that being the case, I think they are ultimately fine with, with the reason why we could get to a five year term. Um, and you know, they bought this at cap rate of seven. If they, if they, um, execute on their pro forma, it'll be an exit cap rate of something like 11%. Wow. I so, mean, so that's a yeah. good spread there on the exit side. Yeah. Um, and so they were probably going to do exit or most likely between five and seven years, then maybe refi. So they got a five year fixed rate versus a seven year. But I mean, it sounds like with a scenario, that's not going to be a big deal. Especially with the upside they're seeing in, in the conversion, the uh, office to industrial conversion, seems like that's something they're comfortable with. Yeah, the other thing that played in the seven year rate or, um, or the seven year term was the rate because you know um, the the yield curve was not very favorable to them, and just general outlook from a bank in a really really aggressive rising interest rate environment, putting seven year money out there is in astronomically greater risk than putting out five-year money. So we ended at three and a half percent here. I think the seven-year rate would have been um, into the fours, like four and a quarter. Oh, wow. So we're talking like yeah. three quarters of a point higher. Yeah. Okay. So yeah, that was going to be my next question because I'm just always curious. Hey, I get that. Hey, I'm, I'm going to have a longer fixed term. Someone on their side has to take that bet and they have to cover their, their bets. Um, guys, this was extremely insightful. I always love sitting down and talk deals with you. I always learn a tidbit or two. I added earn out to my vocabulary today. So thank <laughs> awesome. you guys. Um, and of course, the best place to reach you guys is I like your process. They can email you, go to the website, fill the form. Some of the process I do, people, is you sit down, you have a conversation with people. Hey, who are you? What are your goals? What do you want to do? What do you have right now? What can we do to, to play win-win? So I highly recommend anyone out there who wants to look at commercial financing, uh, reach out to Marcus Loom at Spearhead Commercial Capital. They've taken great care of our clients, and these guys can tell they know their stuff. So thank you, guys. Thank you, yeah, Chris. Thanks, Chris. Appreciate the time.